Very pleased to introduce our guest. Uh, he's an adventurer, a scientist, a showman, a dreamer, and a hero. There's no one quite like him. His imaginative combination of computer-generated imagery, video, music, and stagecraft, and his unique vision of future life is creatively unique and unequaled. Ladies and gentlemen, Marco Tempest. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to my session. My name is Marco Tempest. I'm a cyber illusionist. And today I'm going to show you some of the secrets behind creating magic. Cyber illusionist. What does that mean? Well, it means I combine science and magic to create illusions. Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. That is true, and magicians have known it for over 2,000 years. Around 150 BC, Hero of Alexandria described how the temples of ancient Greece were filled with magic. Altars burst into flames. Doors mysteriously opened. Musical instruments played as if touched by the gods. Hero, a mathematician, also explained how these miracles were accomplished. They were all magic tricks. Applications of the little-known sciences of hydraulics, pneumatics, and chemistry. But to the temple visitors, it was magic. Magic as an entertainment form has long separated itself from the gods and superstition. But it has always maintained its relationship with science. Magicians are the original early adapters of technology. Whenever we hear about a new development in science, whether it's physics, chemistry, optics, or even psychology, we figure ways to use it in our magic, keeping one step ahead of the public and following Arthur C. Clarke's dictum in disguising science as magic. Magic that we now accept as part of the world of entertainment. Now, magic is a, a very introverted field. While scientists regularly publish their latest research, we magicians do not like to share our methods and secrets. That's true even amongst peers. But if we look at creative practice as a form of research, or art as a form of R&D for humanity, then how could a cyber illusionist like myself share his research? My own speciality is combining digital technologies and magic. And about three years ago, I started an exercise in openness and inclusiveness by reaching out into the open source software community to create new digital tools for magic. Tools that could eventually be shared with other artists to start them off further along in the process and to get them to the poetry faster. I would like to show you something which came out of these collaborations. It's an augmented reality projection tracking and mapping system. So let's have some fun with it. Okay. My creative process always begins with a blank canvas, and, uh, which is equally frightening and equally exciting because of the endless possibilities and because of the endless possibilities. <laughs> but uh, once I commit my first stroke, the adventure begins. <laughs> and what an adventure it is for me to be here. <laughs> I forgot the floor, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey. All right, 
Let's play. Please. Oh, of course. <laughs> Okay, he got the hang of it. <laughs> That's enough. No. What? Go for it. <laughs> I would. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Thank you. So, in the spirit of a truly open source magician, I'd like to give you a sneak peek behind the curtain on how this actually works. In front of me is a little video projector. Mounted on it is a high-speed camera, which we see right here. The camera has an infrared passband filter. That filter enables the camera to see tiny little infrared LED, oh, cookie with magnet, <laughs> embedded in the corners of this canvas, which means no matter how I move this canvas, the projection can follow the canvas. There's about 80 times every second we read out the information on where these dots are and we can add uh, video imagery to the canvas. There's also an additional thing which adds illumination to myself like a virtual follow spot which is uh, controlled by the system itself as well. It might be worth mentioning that this was created using free software on the internet. So this is magic projection. It may be worth saying something at this point about the nature of magic. What is magic and why do magic tricks fool us? Now magicians are often thought of as being masters of sleight of hand. The quickness of the hand deceives the eye. But that is not true. Magic does not depend on deceiving the eye. 
It depends on deceiving the brain. The tricks of magicians are not designed to fool the eye. The eye observes whatever is put in front of it. It's the brain that translates the scene into information. And now the brain loves to look for patterns in the environment because it saves time and energy. The brain recognizes elements and assumes that the things it sees now are the same as the things it has seen before. Magicians take advantage of the brain's lazy thinking because in a magic trick, nothing is ever as it seems. The magician designs his tricks, so everything about them seems familiar. The props seem ordinary. The magician's actions above suspicion. Even the words he uses are straightforward and unambiguous. But this veneer of ordinariness covers many deceptions. The eye sees everything, but the brain is being fooled. Now, let me try to show you a card trick and to make sure that I don't use any sleight of hand. I'm going to use some very big cards and you can all play along. I prepared five virtual playing cards. I want you all to remember one of these five cards. Remember the suit and the value of your card. And make up your mind now. Remember your card. Don't forget it. I'm going to mix up the cards just like this. And I'm going to remove one of the cards. Um, how about this one? Now, if I was right, then your card is now gone. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yours disappeared. Don't worry, but mine disappeared too. <laughs> By the way, this trick has a name. All magic tricks have names. This one is called the Prince's Card Trick. It was created by magician Henry Hardin in 1903. He called himself the Prince of Ideas, hence the name the Prince's Card Trick. And it was originally done using real playing cards, but magicians love to create. And over the past hundred years, there have been literally dozens of versions of Hardin's trick. The one you just saw was designed for the 21st century. It eliminates any possibility of sleight of hand. But it wouldn't have been possible without the input of some very creative people. Not magicians, computer programmers and digital designers. And that brings me to another topic which I think is an essential part of the creative process. It's collaboration. If you look at the history of the world, you will find that all great ideas stem from the work of some extraordinary individuals. Some were renowned in their time, others only recognized for their genius posthumously but all changed the history of the world. They had one thing in common. To use a modern cliche, they uh, thought outside the box. They were uh, rare, talented individuals who set the waypoints for art, science, society, and culture. And the rest of humanity followed. Now, the history of magic is exactly the same. Every magician knows the names of people like Johann Nepomuk Hofzinser. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Houdin, Di Vernon, and Robert Harbin. These are the names of our magic heroes. They laid the foundations for our craft. And we can't all be geniuses, but we can build on what has come before and create works that even our heroes could not have imagined in their lifetimes. And one of the best ways of doing that is collaboration. To update Houdin's original trick, I had to collaborate. My goal was to take a 100-year-old card trick and take it into the new media. It's no longer a trick I have to personally perform for every individual. Because of the technology, I can now perform it to large groups of people at the same time. It can work as an interactive trick on the internet, on YouTube or on Vimeo, for example. It can run as a video on television. I have even created a version that works in 3D. Collaboration between different groups in this case, a magician and experts in digital technology can produce amazing results. Now, true collaboration also avoids groupthink. Groupthink is when a group of people with the same background apply themselves to a problem. The result is very likely a natural development of whatever existed before, a tiny step in the evolution of whatever is being discussed. But I think the worst thing about groupthink is that objections and real innovation are often lost. 
The geniuses that contributed most to everything we see around us were also people who believed passionately in their ideas. So passionately that they were prepared to endure any kind of criticism. They had visions of the future that other people didn't share. They weren't part of any group. They were individuals and they persevered. Now it's very difficult for us when brainstorming with colleagues to raise objections or to suggest radical and new ideas. I've heard it said many times, we don't want problems, we want solutions. And the person at the table who seemed to be negative will very often find themselves excluded from the creative process. It sucks to stand up and say, I don't think this works. So we tend to go with the flow and that's why so many projects are disappointing or fail. Working outside of your comfort zone, working with people from entirely different backgrounds and with different skill sets, I find that extremely rewarding. It brings together equally passionate people and generates new and inspiring ideas. And uh, it avoids what any outsider could have told us was an obvious pitfall. It takes us forward into the new and unexplored territory. So we move from the familiar and on to the new. And that's really important for magic because in magic, surprise is everything. Now let me show you something that for me was new territory. The smartphone. It changed the world. When I first saw one of these devices, I was astounded. How could I use this in my own performance? At first, I started creating magic with the phones. I made it levitate, change color, even disappear. But that wasn't very creative. It was just substituting one object for another. So what if the phone itself would become a new platform for magic? One that could be shared by every user. I began to perform and record tricks and magic puzzles with my camera phone. I uploaded these videos directly from my phone onto YouTube. Now the idea went against a lot of what magic was all about. Magic is about secrecy, but the internet is about disseminating information. The biggest platform for communication suddenly seems a bad idea for magic and magicians. Now YouTube is a medium that depends on audience feedback and by default that meant that my videos would not only invite people to figure out how the tricks were done, but to post their thoughts on the topic. Now this is not a conversation magicians generally like to have. The videos also invited them to try to do the tricks themselves. Now this was a bold gamble, but it produced incredible results. I'd like to share with you the first video of the series that I produced. Hi, I'm Marco Tempest. This is a first in a series of videos where I show you my magic with my cell phone camera. Everything you see is exactly the way my cell phone camera saw it. There's no editing and no video tricks at all. So this is it, here we go. Hey guys, that's a very good looking umbrella. You mind if I borrow it for just a moment? Is that all right? I'm gonna pass you the camera phone, just like this. And you can shoot this for me. Can you still see the umbrella? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Now watch. Whoa. Can I give that back to you? Yeah, and let me have the camera. Whoa. <laughs> That's the key. That's the key. Make sure we Yeah. <laughs> this video with almost zero production value got over a million views in the first few hours. In keeping with the momentum, I started creating a weekly camera phone magic puzzle. The feedback on YouTube after each video was released was tremendous. People love to try to figure out how the tricks were done. They created their own versions of the tricks and uploaded them onto YouTube. And uh, some of them even made fun of me and my funny Swiss accent. <laughs> Hello, my name is Marco Tempest, and today I'm going to show you some magic on my camera phone. Hi, my name is Marco Tempest. 
Um, this is another one of those things where I show you my magic using my webcam camera phone. I'm here to uh, bust Marco Tempest. Uh, it's not even sleight of hand. Um... Hi, I'm Marco Tempest. Okay, it was a huge success. 25 videos and 50 plus million views. Not just for the videos I posted, but for all the videos my viewers posted. The departure from my slick Polish TV magician type persona to the dorky cell phone guy on YouTube was risky, but it produced incredible results and opened the doors to many new and exciting opportunities. I'd like to show you one more video of the series. It was commissioned by the United Nations Millennium Campaign. Hi there, I'm Marco Tempest. I'm here to show you some magic with nothing more than my camera phone and absolutely no post-production or video editing. Now this is my friend Elia. Elia is going to hold the camera to show you where I'm sitting. I'm sitting here comfortably in New York City's Columbus Park. Now when you're sitting down, nothing happens. But when you're standing up, things start to happen. In the year 2000, the leaders of 189 nations promised to end global poverty. They promised to make ending global poverty a priority. But if you're sitting down, nothing happens. But if we're standing up, we can remind those leaders about their promise. All over the world, people will stand up and be counted to mark the most people in history to stand up and support a global cause. Now, if we sit down, Nothing happens. But if we stand up, things start to happen, just like magic. To find out more, go to millenniumcampaign.org. There's no trick to it. So stand up and make it happen. Now tonight, we can all use our cell phones Magic to provoke social change. <laughs> now risk is part of creativity. And taking risks means that sometimes you have to abandon old ideas in favor of better ones. In my own career, I've reinvented myself several times. As a teenager, I wanted to be like the traditional magician. The cool sleight of hand artists I had seen in theaters and on television. But you can't expect to borrow ideas and images that others have created and have them fit you. I changed my image a lot. Sometimes I tried to be like the magicians I admired. Sometimes I tried to be like the magicians I thought the market would like. It was a long time before I realized that imitation is not creation. My best ideas were the ones that I was most passionate about. Good or bad, they were unique to me. So I took the risk and I followed them. Now, if you're not taking a risk, taking a chance on an idea that you are passionate about, then you probably aren't being as creative as you'd like to be. It reminds me of another thing that Arthur C. Clarke said. The only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. So I'd like to try something impossible. I'm gonna need somebody from the audience to help me. Would you mind helping us up here? Wonderful. Let's have a big round of applause for our volunteer. <laughs> How are you doing? Good, and you're Nicole. <laughs> it's gonna get better, I promise. <laughs> now, I'd like to take a photo of you before we start, if you don't mind. Uh, let's make this uh, a photo of us in the middle of a card game. So you have your, this hand up just like this. Perfect. You're holding a card, a winning card. So you're really smiling. I take a picture of you with your winning card. Hold on. A very, very beautiful picture I just took. <laughs> Let me see. I, I'm not going to show it yet to the, to the audience, if that is all right. And uh, I want to put the camera on your hand so you're going to be safeguarding it. Just hold your hand like this. Wonderful. And we leave it here till the very end of this little experiment. Now, if we would be playing cards in a deck of cards, there are 52 different cards. We have them right up here on the screen. There are four suits. There's hearts, clubs, spades, and diamonds. Which one would you like? Clubs. Clubs. Very unusual. You want to change your mind? No. <laughs> C 
so you're not the person I talked to before. <laughs> All right, clubs. So in clubs, there are 13 different cards. There's from one till 10, check, queen, or king. Which one would you like? Nine. All right, the nine of clubs. That's a completely free choice, right? We didn't prearrange this in any way. Um, I brought with me uh, a wallet. Inside the wallet is uh, an envelope, not 52 envelopes, I might say. One envelope. Inside the envelope. <laughs> This works would be so great. <laughs> Inside the envelope is a single card, and I'm gonna take this card out, and uh, it would be the nine of clubs. I shouldn't clap. No, yeah, you shouldn't. You shouldn't clap. You also remember um, the picture we took of you before the, yes. the trick started, right? And on the picture, which I took from you freely, and I don't know if you can describe to the audience what you see on it this. It is a nine of clubs. And where is and the nine of clubs? It is in my hand. And let's show this to the audience. Just one second. Let's have a big round of applause for our volunteer, while she makes her way back. Thank you very much for helping out. And uh, this is the picture we took. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Hmm. So, to make any idea work, you need confidence. You need confidence that you can execute it. And getting that confidence isn't easy because sometimes what works on paper doesn't work in practice. When I was around 16 years old and practicing to be a magician, I tried all the hard stuff. Knuckle busting, finger breaking, sleight of hand. Now it's really hard practicing this in front of your mirror. But performing in front of a paying audience is absolutely terrifying. And then on top of that, you have to make it look easy. Now, this may sound really cute and sentimental, but to get over my fear, I would put little smiley face stickers on the back of my props that scared me the most. Way too cute, right? But this positive conditioning worked, and looking at these stickers, I would gain confidence, and uh, I was able to perform challenging feats without any worries. Now, really going to actually need one of these right now, because what I'm about to do is uh, in the more difficult department. I sh I'm sure you all recognize this. It was created by designer Erno Rubik. When asked how the blocks could be moved around in every direction without the cube falling apart. Now, he solved the problem of moving the blocks around. But then he realized there was another problem. How do you move them back into their original position? What started as a structural design problem became the world's most famous puzzle. And that's one of the most beautiful things about anything you create. One creation will lead to another. It's a journey filled with surprises. Now, did you know there's an entire subculture of Rubik's Cube fanatics that call themselves cubists? These cubists can solve these intricate puzzles at lightning speed. I happen to be one of them. So just before the session started, we handed out a couple of Rubik's Cubes. I want to hand out a few more. Don't worry, your job is not to fix them. Your job is just to give it a few twists as much as you can, as hard as you can. You already had one, right? I'm going to start with yours, please. Thank you. Just mix them up. Lovely. All right. The Rubik's Cube was invented like 25 years ago, so I had plenty of time to, pr time to practice. Can I have this back? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Ouch. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to start with yours. Okay. Now um, I'm going to give this just a few more twists, so don't take your eye off the cube. Usually a little faster, just like this. <laughs> Thank you. Now, okay, you could say this is an extraordinary skill, or you could say I was a 16-year-old with too much time on his hands. <laughs> Both would be correct. Now, among cubists, there's this group of eccentrics. Only a handful of us um, can solve a cube to a specific degree. So I'll, I'll show you what that, what that means. The cube. Okay. I'm going to just look at this really quick. I'm not going to give any twists. 
to this one. Okay, I'm going to place it here for just a moment. Not sure if I can pull this off. All right, we have two completely mixed up cubes, which is a good sign. Um, yeah, side number one of your cube and side one, number one of my cube are a perfect match. Same is true for side number two, three, four, five, and uh, six. Okay, now I have to be honest, the very first time I tried this, I, I couldn't solve the cubes and there was no match. Beautiful. Okay, but I kept working on it and then, I'm not sure if this is going to work here. Um, quick shot. Beginning is always really easy. Very smooth. Let's get this. Give me a second. Let's see if this is it. Let's get the same pattern. I don't know if you see me struggling up here. Let's <laughs> so <I> try this. <laughs> yeah. Believe in yourself, and others will too. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, let me try to sum up my thinking on creativity. Magic is a naturally creative environment, but there's some basic rules that can be applied to every situation. First, we need creativity. Without it, today would be the same as yesterday, and tomorrow, the same as today. Creativity is a natural human resource. We shouldn't waste it. Second, be passionate. Whatever it is that you do, you must love it. I've been a magician since I was seven years old, and I dedicated my entire life to creating illusions of one sort or another. It's an endless fascination. Third, know your subject. Technology changes, but good ideas are always good ideas and can be repurposed to suit new times and applications. Think of Henry Ardennes' card trick from 1903. I know that trick will still be around in one form or another in another hundred years. Fourth, avoid groupthink. Brainstorming doesn't work if you all start out with the same thoughts. Brainstorming doesn't work if you keep your thoughts to yourself. And brainstorming doesn't work if you're not prepared to listen to everyone and explore every option. Fifth, we've been through an area of specialization where experts can be defined as people who know more and more about less and less. That doesn't lead to radical change. Collaborate. Work outside of your comfort zone. Join forces with talented people that don't think the same way you do. Take risks. You will both learn something, you will have fun, you will create new possibilities. Finally, believe in yourself. One of the most talented men of all time was Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He excelled in art, science, literature, a true polymath. Magic, he said, is believing in yourself. If you can do that, you can make anything happen. Now, we can't all be geniuses like Goethe. But I truly believe that given the right framework, we can all be creative. Magicians make the impossible happen every day. So can you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to show you one more item. It's a melding of traditional magic and cutting edge technology and that reflects my current obsession for blurring the line between reality and the imagination. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so I have this contraption here, which uh, will enable you to see what I see. And the idea here is that um, it will give you a glimpse into the mind of a magician when he does something as simple as a trick with playing cards. 
Now I need a little bit of assistance. If you wouldn't mind saying stop anywhere you like. Stop. Perfect. I'm going to give this card to you. And we're going to mark the card just so we recognize it when we see it again. So if on the, on the face of the card you could write a sig your signature, for example, that would be lovely. And your name? Estelle. Estelle. Beautiful. Thank you very much. She's hiding the card really well from me. Let's start up the system really quick. System ready Sci-fi. <laughs> OK. You hit the card really well from me. I have to disappoint you just a little bit. We are going to show it to everyone. Ah, oh, lovely. OK. We have Estelle's card. All right. I'm going to lose the card in the deck, which means that if I'm just going to put it in the deck, and uh, give the cards a quick cut, quick shuffle, just like this. Now, for those of you who don't play cards, a deck of cards is made up of four different suits. There's hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. Watching magic. Of what is false and what is true. Performing magic is always about multiple layers of reality combining. Now each of the four suits is connected to one of the four seasons. There's spring, summer, fall, and winter. My favorite season is winter. Oh, mine too. Like magic, winter involves visual wonder, drastic change, and the delicate balance between its physical states. The quick cut. In each of the four suits, there's a total of 13 cards. Each card representing a phase in the 13 lunar cycles. So over here is high tide, and over here is low tide. High tide, low tide, in the middle is the moon. There are two colors in the deck of cards. There's the color red, and then there's the color black, representing the constant change from day to night. Marco, I did not know you could do Now in a complete, <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> In a complete deck of cards, there are 52 cards, representing the 52 days or weeks of the year. If we count all the cards together, let's see, three, six, five. The values of all the cards are the result is 365. Which is really interesting, 365. That's the exact number of days between um, Estelle's birthday, is it that? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Actually, it was on my sixth birthday when I received my first deck of cards. And ever since then, I have traveled around the world entertaining boys and girls, men and women, husbands and wives, kings and queens. <laughs> Now we have to watch out, these guys can be real hecklers. Hey, wake up. Are you ready? Let me see what you got. Hey, hey, be careful. <laughs> but today I'm performing for a different kind of audience. Today I'm performing for... Oh yeah, Estelle. <laughs> Let's put it over here. Now, sometimes people ask me to do magic. Can you just work from nine to five? Of course not. You have to practice 24 seven. Uh, 24 seven is a little bit of an exaggeration. 24 hours, seven days a week. Well, but it does take practice. Although some people will say performing magic is the work of some evil supernatural forces. <laughs> oh.
to this, I say no, no. Okay, in German, it's nine, nine. <laughs> it's really not so intense. I have to warn you though, if you ever play with somebody who's so good with cards, don't play him for money because even if you receive a decent hand, he'll be prepared. <laughs> and that leaves me with the last and most important card of all. This is without a question the real thing. Sorry, card <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give your oh. oh, thank you very much. Do you have a card? Yes. Oh, and Marco, would you mind if I post some of that on YouTube? Absolutely sure? fine, yeah. It's very good. It's a here. Thank you very much. Can I give you one of my cards? <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming to the session. Brilliant. Oh, the first one, the drawing. Oh, thank you. All right. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're going into companies for big events. Yes. Yeah, here are a few examples playing right now and how it looks on bigger stages and, and with that. That's why the card is for. And oh. the filming. <laughs> Excellent, that was great, thank you. Yes, absolutely. Oh, uh, those are. Mm -hmm. Please, thank you very much. It was unbelievable. I really enjoyed it, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Ja, klar. Danke fürs Kommen. Merci vielmals. Hi, that was remarkable, I must say. Oh, thank, thank you very much. I'll, I'll give you my card. It's always easy to contact do you do me. Corporate events too? I do a lot of corporate events, yeah.